Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. I'm your host for today's episode, Joe Nash, and today I'm joined by Hein Peter Van Braun. HP is a longtime Godot contributor and games industry veteran and co-founder of Ram Attack, which aims to make it easier to build mobile games with Godot. Welcome, HP. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So we've got uh, a bunch of stuff to talk about in you know relation to Godot and mobile development on Godot and Ram Attack. But I want to start with your Godot journey because I'm I'm aware that you're on the board for Godot and you've been a contributor for a long time. So how did that start for you? Oh God, um, we can go very far back. Um, when I was a wee little kid, uh, my dad had a ZX Spectrum. And I uh, was uh, very interested in the basic uh, code, et cetera, that make, made, made games go, make computer go brr. So I learned um, basic uh, on that thing because I wanted to make video games. Then I basically set my entire like school and everything in the idea that I want to make video games. And then obviously I, I ended up uh, doing infrastructure work. <laughs> so I then spent uh, the next, uh, what is it, 20 years, I guess, uh, doing like Linux admining, data center development, things like that, until I got very, very, very bored with that. And then I was like, I have all these video games I want to make, so I'm going to start making a game. And previously, all I was ever ended up doing was making video game engines, right? Because right. I'm a nerd. So I ended up, instead of making games, I ended up making game engines. And at one point, I was like, you know what? I'm never going to make a game engine and a game, so I'm just going to pick a game engine, and I'm going to use it to make a game. And I picked Godot. The first thing that happened was that Godot didn't work on newer versions of GCC, and I was like, that can't be right. So I ended up fixing that. And uh, the story since then is basically that I still haven't made a video game and have been a video game engine engineer for the past 10 years now, I guess. so uh, after a while, the uh, Linux infrastructure stuff became completely unbearable, and I quit my job, started a company specifically to do consulting for Godot called uh, Prehensile Tales. So I've been doing that for quite a while now. And then about a year ago, Ariel uh, approached me to uh, with an investment uh, opportunity for uh, in a new Godot company, kind of like modeled after uh, after other startups. And I was very excited, so I jumped up on that. So that's what I've been doing for the last year. Um, yeah, and when I got into Godot, the community was much smaller. And um, if you started doing things, you kind of rose up the ranks fairly quickly. Um, so I ended up on a, a leadership position like fairly quickly. I, I want to say like six months to a year or something like that. I ended up on what was then called the Project Leadership Commission, which was when we were still uh, a a Software Freedom Conservancy project. Mm -hmm. Uh, I then helped set up the new Godot Foundation as a nonprofit in the Netherlands, and I am treasurer of that now. So that is is in a very brief, brief section. So wanted to make video games and not game engines, ended up owning to game engine creation related companies. So that's fantastic. I'm doing great. <laughs> Living the dream. So how did you, you know, obviously that was a, a fairly early into Godot's journey, uh, you know, after it, I guess, went fully open source. How did you discover it at the time? Like wh- wh- where did you find Godot back then? Um, I, whew, that's a good question. I think I was just looking for open source game engines, and uh, I was always interested in the topic because I was I always had this in the back of my mind. And then I saw um, the Godot is now open source uh, tweet probably from Juan at some point. Uh, then Godot went from 1.0 to 2.0, and at the I have to say, uh, and since this is a bit of a nerdy audience, I'll, I think this is a, a, a thing that they can relate with too. Originally, I was like, well, this thing is have all of this together, and I can't make any technical choices myself. And originally, I kind of dismissed it as something that I wouldn't actually be able to use, and it would be too uh, batteries included, basically. Right. Um, and... I actually started another game make using my own engine. And then I was like, this is not going to work. Uh, so I ended up uh, uh, just trying it out. And I was super impressed by like, okay, sure, you can't make certain technical choices, which originally really sort of like hurt me to my nerd core. Right, right. <laughs> um, but um, once I got used to it, I was like, actually like, well, 
now I don't have to think about all of these things and I can just make my goddamn game. Um, so that is that is that is how it how it went. Um, I played around with a game engine called. It was the open source version of a game engine that was once called used by Tribes. Oh, Torque Engine. Torque. That's it. Torque. Thank you so much. It. Torque <laughs> Engine. Yes. So I used a Torque Engine for for a little while. Yeah. Uh, and um, the thing that really impressed me at the time, and it was before I saw Godot, was just how quickly you could make like three D scenes by just dropping things in, and the game mm-hmm. kind of looked like it, it looked like on the editor. And Godot does that as well, and in my opinion, just a little bit better. Right. Um, so that that is how I, how I got there. Perfect. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you know, you mentioned Prehensile Tales, which first of all, fantastic name pun, just absolutely brilliant. Um, and then obviously Ram Attack, which is what uh, most of my questions about for you today. So sure. Um, first of all, I guess I want to start setting the scene. So what is Ram Attack in in like a pitch? <laughs> Ramatag is a basically a distribution of the Godot engine where we've integrated all of the the nonsense that you need to make an actual game uh, on a mobile platform. So we install the Android SDKs for you and configure them correctly. We uh, make sure that your Xcode is set up correctly if you're on a Mac. And we've done some um, performance improvements for the 2D and 3D renderer uh, for uh, for mobile specifically. So we added some features uh, for uh, the depth pass, et cetera, to make that just faster. And we've improved the way that you can integrate with uh, third-party um, profiling tools, so you can actually see what's happening on your device. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of this stuff has went u- upstream as well, so this is not um, entirely exclusive to Ramatech, but you know we have to we p- put it all together in a very easy-to-use package, basically. Sure. Um, and the reasoning behind that was that what we found is that if you look at the uh, like Godot Q and A's uh, and the forums and what people ask about in Discord, it's like everyone wants to make games on mobile, but they basically fall at the first hurdle of like making doing all of this um, uh, yuck shaving to get their system ready to even begin to develop a mobile game. So we were like. Well, the Godot project, the open source project, can't really solve this because we can't ship open uh, proprietary software, and mm-hmm. we don't want to, uh, because as an open source project, that's just not our mission goal. Um, so uh, that is how it started. And the next thing it was okay. How do we make sure that when people have actually have made a mobile game, that they can actually you know make some money off of it? Yeah. And uh, what we've done there is uh, we've partnered with a ad mediation company and we have a version of the engine um, that basically comes with batteries included for everything you really need for mobile. So you sign up for the mediation company, dump your API key into the Godot editor, and then you just drag your ads onto your game and then you're done. Then you can uh, start shipping uh, a monetized game. Uh, That is what we want to do. The idea being that the, the time frame we set is basically from not knowing anything about mobile to being able to have a monetized game on the App Store in about two hours. And I think we've, we're getting very close to that. Um, so that's the general idea. Just, just make it as Perfect. easy as possible for um, developers to either take their existing Godot game and monetize it on, uh, mm-hmm. on a mobile platform or just use the whole tool chain for a mobile game. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, speaking to that ads piece. So in the recent um, GodotCon talk, you laid out, I guess, the challenges of doing an ad-supported game in a way that you know you you highlighted some issues I'd never heard before. And I think one of the things you um, mentioned a couple of times was that you know there are various reasons throughout a game's life that some that a mobile game developer may have to re-export, recompile their game again because of changes to their ads infrastructure. Can you run us through that that problem and what mobile developers are dealing with there? Sure. Um, So there's two main problems that mobile developers run into. One of them is simply the fact that Apple and Google are incredibly fickle, and they might change the rules on what you can and can't do on their store anytime. They might change the type of SDKs that you need to use at any time. And every time that happens, uh, you have to do work to to keep your game on the store, keep your income uh, from from the game going. And uh, that is painful. And with um, with Godot and by extension with Ramatak, what we can do is because it's open source, we can basically take an old version of the engine and uh, make it so that if you re-export today, that your 
that your game works exactly as it did, like when you made it maybe two years ago, but now with all of the new um, uh, requirements from Apple and Google, etc., uh, apply to the game that you already have. Uh, we call that like backlog management, and um, that's I think something that is difficult for an open source project to do because like finding volunteers to take like a Godot version from three years ago and uh, fixing it up so that right. that particular version now works in today's app stores is difficult because it is frankly a little bit boring and there is just a lot of like it's it's like paperwork right it's 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 paper pushing work almost so that is something that we do uh, the other thing is um, switching ad providers. So ad providers change uh, their payout scheme that to change how much uh, revenue you can actually get from a particular game. But not only that, not every ad provider performs well in every market. So for instance, there are ad providers that uh, work much better in Asia than say in Europe. So if you want to really publish your game far and wide, you end up having to not imp implement one SDK, you end up having to implement four or five SDKs for different regions, sometimes like different times of day. Um, so what we've done is we've created an abstraction layer in the engine itself mm -hmm. uh, that provides ads. So we have basically have a node if, if you're a Godot, if you've ever used Godot. So you can just create ad nodes in your, in your game with a standard API. And then at export time, you decide what ad networks actually end up be implemented behind those nodes. Um, so what that means is, for instance, you can very easily, say, make a version of your engine, of, sorry, of your game for an European market with a different ad network than, say, for an American market. Um, so th those are the two main challenges that we're trying to address and also the two main challenges that we've seen from various uh, mobile developers. Awesome. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So again, going back to that Godot con talk. So obviously a lot of the things you mentioned when you introduced Ram Attack were like really interesting developer experience improvements, you know, making it seamless to get started building games, not have to worry about all this other stuff. When you were running through why Godot is already very good for developers, you mentioned GD script, the you know, inbuilt included scripting language as one of the, the things that makes it great for mobile devs. Can you talk a little bit about why that is? Ah, yes, of course. Um, so the thing about mobile devs that is, uh, th this is something that exists for all types of games, don't get me wrong. But um, the way that mobile games are monetized is very around like playtime and, and to a certain extent, the, the negative version of saying that is getting people hooked on it, but I think the, the more positive spin you can give to that is make something that people want to play, right? right. <laughs> and I think that that is a, most of the time, a more uh, a more honest description of what is actually happening. So you need to make a game that people want to play. And in order to do that, you need to be able to tweak your game uh, after playtest really rapidly and and change these little things like this. Does this ball need to like bounce like half a second longer? Is the is the visual squishiness of this thing like like just at, at peak cute or is like a little bit more squishiness slightly cuter, etc. <laughs> There's a lot of these like like minutia that on mobile are amplified compared to other games. Mm -hmm. um, so on desktop, people will try your game, and particularly if they've already spent like a dollar or two or three on Steam on your game, they are more willing to like explore what is there. And if something is not ideal immediately, they are they are usually happier to kind of like push through that and then find sort of like the hidden gems within. With mobile games, they tend to be free, so people will just install like five, six, seven of them in a day and try which one they want. And if they don't, if they're not like immediately hooked on it or immediately interested in it, they will just go away, and there goes mm -hmm. all your ad revenue. Right? Uh, th this is really about your script. I will get there now. Um, so, because you need to have this very fluid. Uh, um, way of iterating on your game, having a scripting language that is built into the engine and that doesn't need compiling and that you can just live edit basically with your device running um, is a huge time saver. And it lets you do these iterations maybe two, three, four times faster depending on you know the quality of your machine. Like if you have some 20 core monstrosity, then probably a C sharp will be fine. But um, 
if you have like a, a regular sort of game dev laptop or something like that, and you don't want to invest in this, you know, nuclear power plants worth of, uh, of computing power, then having something like GDScript is, is just this force multiplier. Mm-hmm. Um, not only that, um, it makes it much easier to create little scripts that say maybe your game designers can actually directly edit rather than having to go through the developers for. So right. that is that is really my main uh, uh, my main thing where I'm where I'm like GD script is just this 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 rapid development tool almost for yeah. for your game feel and. I feel that particularly on mobile, this is a a quality that that cannot be underestimated. Uh, yeah, that's yeah that read that in, the importance of I guess the extra importance of juice in the in the mobile section is is really interesting. I haven't heard it expressed that way before. So yeah, that I mean I'm I'm sold. I think that that works. I'm a big GD Script fan already, so I didn't have much selling to do much. Yeah, selling to do, but that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so uh, I was I was preaching to the choir, as they say. Well, yeah. So that leads me on to you know something that we spoke about briefly before we jumped on the recording, which is your uh, you were working on a on a on a project which I think is is super super cool, which is to you know bring GD Script to LLVM, or I guess bring LLVM to GD Script, whichever way around you think about that. Um, for listeners who aren't aware, LLVM is the the low level virtual machine. It's a compiler backend that's used in all kinds of of high performance programming languages. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you know what that project is and the inspiration behind it? Right. So the main inspiration behind it is is that what I frequently see in forums where people come and ask, okay, how, I want to start making a, a, a game in Godot, what do I do? And a large percentage of uh, more veteran uh, game developers will almost immediately steer people towards like compiled languages uh, with the idea being that it's faster. Um, while technically true, like C Sharp is faster than GD Script and C++ is even faster, um, for literally 95% of your games and, and of those 5%, like 80% of that code is not actually performance critical. So for the most part, um, you can like... You can make Candy Crush in GD Script, right? Sure. You can make Infinite Runners in GD Script. You can make uh, uh, hidden puzzle games in GD Script. There's no need to use C Sharp for any of that. Um, but because of this, um, I want to say almost cultural or political thing around that you need your games to be as fast as possible, I see a lot of um, novice developers getting steered down a path which requires them to set up tooling, requires them to learn an extra language, requires them to u- learn a new IDE, because generally speaking, uh, using C Sharp comes with using Visual Studio Code, and now you have to install a .NET runtime, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of ands there. Whereas the experience that I want people to have when they start making games is you download this one executable, you double click it, and you start making a game. Um, because that is satisfying, you get quick results, and uh, it is very low. Um, uh, there's a low barrier of entry to that. Yeah. So, in part, the reason uh, for the LLVM compiler is simply that that is to make sure that. Um, uh, novice developers, when they talk to experienced developers, that the experienced developers can say something like, yeah, C-sharp might be a little faster, but GD script is like 90% of the way there, right? So that gives people less of a incentive to, to have to switch. The other thing is, there is this sort of like 5%, 10% of code that can be slow in GD script. And sure. the... Um, Experience there for experienced developers is actually really, really good um, because the, due to the way Godot is set up with a node uh, with a node system, taking a bit of code in GD script, making that into a C plus plus module, and just building that into your game is actually really easy for mm-hmm. for seasoned developers, particularly if they're not only game developers. Um, but for more novice play, uh, players, <laughs> novice developers. Um, this is a big hurdle because now again we we have to set up an external tool chain. You have to build this module for all of your target platforms. Uh, how do you even do that? How do you get a iOS compiled binary uh, created for your uh, for your game? It is hard. Yeah. And um, so 
this is one of the, and this is the sort of like the second tag of this. So uh, I want to make sure that for most of the things you could want to do in your game, like procedural generation comes to mind as, as one of the main things where GD script is oftentimes a little bit on the slower side for, for some people. Um, making sure that you can write all of that in GD script and still get like 80%, 85% of the performance, which is right. probably more than good enough. Like, if you have a gigantic development team and you're you're like thinking between oh should I use Godot or you or Unreal or something like that at that point you have the developers to do this so this is not for them this is yeah. for the smaller teams that that need just a little bit of extra oomph. Um, sure. That's awesome. a very long winded end, answer, I guess, to say it would be good if it was faster. <laughs> yeah. So I guess. And I know this is early on in the project, so you might a lot of the technical details might not be fully sketched out yet. But how is how does that integration work? So you mentioned there, you know, GD script compiling to GD extensions via C plus plus. Is that how you envisage this being used? Um. So you mean instead of that, or uh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, like, what? Where does L like where does LLVM sit in Godot in this case? Like, what is it? What is the GD script? turning into through LLVM, I guess, is my question. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, yeah, so the way I want to do this is we include a linker in, mm -hmm. so because LLVM is, the, the project itself is much larger than than just the, the, the like, low-level VM, right? Sure. There's a lot yeah. of tooling around it. And the nice thing about LLVM is that all of these tools are available as libraries. So we can mm -hmm. have a... Um, an actual like elf linker or an or a, per, a PE linker, etc., inside the editor itself. So what we can do is ship the export templates as object files, and then the um, LLVM uh, ahead of time compiled code can just be put in this pile of object files that gets linked as we export. So that is that is the the general idea of what I want to do. The other difficult part for this that we are still kind of thinking about is whether if you install this, whether you, we want to still use the old style 2D script VM or if what we're going to do is take the LLVM VM, the actual right. VM part of it, plug that into the editor for uh, your um, your very quick runtime and then at export time do this uh, do this ahead of time compilation. There is a bit of things there that are still a little bit unclear. And there's also some interactions that we have with uh, the proprietary platforms, particularly on uh, on console, where Microsoft and Sony don't really want you to use compilers that they don't give you, but also they can't really check. So uh, <laughs> Sony execs don't listen to this bit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we're not sure how to do that yet. Um, LLVM has an option to actually spit out C instead of uh, LLVM IR. So what we might end up doing is for those targets that instead of spitting out object files, we actually split uh, spit out C files. So if you want to publish on PlayStation or Xbox, that what you end up getting is uh, just a pile of C files and maybe some kind of project solution so that if you build the engine, you then build the C files with the um, with the compilers for that target platform. Because by the time you're uh, deploying on those kinds of targets, you already have to set up this right. gigantic tool chain anyway. So trying to balance this, uh, this needs of novice developers or intermediate developers versus like the large teams that know how to set up all of these tool yeah. chains, that's, that's kind of the, the friction point there. How do we make it fast and accessible for everyone? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. So... I guess that that leads me to a, I guess a, a general theme, which is you know Ram Attack as a business, and what from what you're making is going upstream. So you mentioned earlier that a lot of what you're adding is going upstream where it makes sense. Um, can you kind of draw like what kind of stuff do we see moving upstream to Godot? So anything we do that improves the direct developer experience of using the engine, we end up uh, wanting to put upstream. So we're talking about the uh, improvement in. Um, profiling, the performance improvements, that kind of thing goes upstream. Uh, the things that we can't put upstream are the things that are directly related to things like the ad networks sure. and, and things like that. We are thinking about maybe upstreaming the ad abstraction layer, mm -hmm. uh, but that will require some um, 
some politicking and and just making sure that the, the project actually wants that in in the form that we've made it um so that is generally where i draw the line sort of like i want the ramatuck products value add to be the um sort of like turnkey way of starting mobile development and but not like it being a superior renderer to the open source version and stuff it is sure. it is very important to me personally that the um ramatuck version is both backwards and forwards compatible with upstream godot because one of the things that is uh, difficult about the game engine landscape right now is just that this complete lack of trust in this entire industry right unity's um let's say escapades have not <laughs> really helped with that so i want to make sure that the ramatuck product is safe for developers that is okay you use our version of the engine and we think you will like it better than the uh, mm -hmm. than the up, uh, upstream version but we don't want to make it a, a, a binary choice in the sense, okay, I've, I switched to the Ramatag engine and now my game is stuck in this version of the of Godot. We, we don't want to do that. So we want to make sure that this is a free choice for our customers or for our users and that we actually have a value add that isn't like, oh, we, I've picked this one time and now I don't have a choice right. anymore. So that is kind of, where this line is, and I realize that it's a little bit fuzzy because it is a little bit fuzzy. Because yeah. when I when we add something, will that impact people's ability to take their games out of Ramatag Mobile Studio and into Godot Upstream or not? Yeah. Um, but but that is the question we ask whenever we add anything uh, yeah. to the engine. And then yeah, also as you said, you know, upstreaming things isn't just a case of you saying oh we like we built this and we like it off to godot it goes they have to also want to have it as well right so right exactly because um while i am part of the board of directors of the foundation that does not give me any special <laughs> ability to like get features merged uh there is a process for that and and i can't i can't like skip that process either mm -hmm. So making things that are use, generally useful and making things that people want mm -hmm. remains the most important thing. Like uh, one of the things I talked about, uh, just about the engine in general for like a long time, just as part of the board, when, when some of this stuff came out, like um, we talked about adding um, NVIDIA physics to the engine for a while, for instance, because there was a BSD version for desktops. But you had to pay for it for mobile platforms. And this was well before Ramatak, et cetera. And our general stance on that is that we don't want Godot, the open source project, to basically be a storefront for third parties to like sell right. special access, right? Um, and that is also something that we have to, to keep in mind with, with the features we add here now. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so along the way there, you mentioned just very briefly, you know, that there are some rendering improvements to mobiles being made uh, in Ramatak. Um, can you talk about those? There's there's one in particular that's very interesting, but I think it's good to intro the general sure. things yeah. you're aiming for. I am. So first of all, I am not a rendering engineer. Ramatak hired rendering engineers, but I can give you a high level yeah. overview of, of what we did. So one of the things is we um, the. There is an extension, OpenGL extension, that can do some of the um, depth buffer in hardware. Mm -hmm. And we've implemented that. The original idea of thinking was that that would not be faster than the CPU method, I guess, okay. uh, uh, for that particular uh, feature. But we found after a little bit of uh, benchmarking that actually using uh, those extensions on uh, on the engine actually helped a lot. And we were able to take the third-person shooter demo app and run it on Android uh, with like 40, 50% higher frame rates just with some of these little tweaks. Um, so it's it's those kinds of things, uh, mm -hmm. uh, things that volunteers like tend to not have necessarily have time for, right? So finding like a pile of phones and seeing if this particular OpenGL extension is actually faster than um, uh, than what we sort of like the common wisdom is, things like that. So we because we have a rendering engineer, we have a pile of phones, so we can just try these kinds of things. Um, so that that's the biggest one. Uh, we've also done some things where we are not allocating uh, frame buffers for unused parts of the shader. So that mm -hmm. brings down the memory uh, use, particularly on mobile. This is very important down. 
uh, and um, we've done some lighting improvements for which I do not know the technical details. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. No, that's very interesting. Uh, so I guess one of the again from from your GodotCon talk, one of again one of the things I hadn't quite appreciated about building mobile games and i guess that's because you know it's very easy as a iphone person to get locked into like the monolith is just the amount of platforms you need to support um do you talk a little bit about that and uh particularly yeah, i think there was some, something interesting also with supporting itch exports is that ring a bell was... yeah so that was mostly for the uh for the web exports sure sure so this this comes to godot 4 so godot 4 is our next generation of the engine yeah. right so we've we've thrown caution in the wind and made a, a more visually rich um, uh, renderer, which is great uh, and it works really well. But the problem is that mobile phones move slower than desktop to a certain extent. But part of the reason for that is that for a lot of people, their mobile phone is basically their only computer. So they buy one and then they use it for basically all of their computing needs. And they sometimes have to stretch this for quite a long time so the fact that like um, you can do Vulkan on mobile is great, but there is a lot of phones in which it doesn't work right or is, is slow, et cetera. So uh, making sure that you can actually take your 2D game and ship it to devices that are 10 years old, 12 years old, et cetera, that is actually kind of challenging in the way uh, Godot is set up right now. So one of the things we're doing is we're developing an OpenGL ES2 renderer, which is the, the most baseline of baseline uh, 3D APIs uh, that, that is still uh, supported. And the reason for that is primarily to make sure that you can basically take these simpler games that don't need like Vulkan 1.3 with all extensions uh, and just take your, you know, your Candy Crush, your, your 2D puzzle games, your other things and actually deploy them to a, to as wide an audience as possible. So that, that is the, the primary, I think, difference between desktop and mobile development in that the the range of devices and also the range of capabilities of those devices is so vastly different like on desktop you have one of three gpu vendors right you have an intel gpu you have an amd gpu or you have an nvidia gpu on mobile that is not the case because you could have like a very capable gpu on your device but the drivers for it were made like eight years ago and nobody has updated them and they're terrible so uh the the, the matrix of things is is much wider and much less forgiving as well because mobile games also have the big uh let's say downside that there is reviews on those websites so if you create a relatively simple game that people look at in into store and they see uh, a simple 2d graphics and they install it on their six-year-old phone and it doesn't run they're going to give you a one-star review and that's going to tank your uh, your overall standing in the stores etc um so we want to work around that a little bit by first just testing on more devices and try to fix the higher level renderers on those but there is no fixing some of these, right? There is there is just devices that just cannot be fixed. There is no workaround that makes that makes your your Vulkan renderer work on some of these devices. So for that we have the uh, ES2 renderer, and the idea there is just that this will work on everything that can still be charitably called usable today. And um, Doing that, I think, will just open up Godot to way more things. And as we talked about the itch.io uh, exports, people want to be able to export their games as a web export. And uh, Godot 4 does support that, but that needs WebGL 2 support because the uh, fallback renderer is an OpenGL ES3 renderer. And that doesn't work on all platforms either. Particularly, Apple seems to be very uh, concerned about uh, allowing people to run WebGL 2 content in their browsers. So they really only work well with WebGL 1. And that sadly requires an ES2 renderer as well. So the idea being that if we upstream this, we get these benefits for these older phones and we get the benefits for Game Jam games that just want to ship their games on HIO with a click to play on the browser. Fantastic. Um, so along the way there, you know, you started talking about Godot 4, um, which I'm very interested because in yeah, at time of recording, RAM attack supports 3.5.1, right? Yeah. Um, and between all these rendering things and then also, you know, having to support 
versions in perpetuity for the you know the ad updating vision i imagine your business of like supporting keeping pace with the godot open source releases is like a key challenge for you how does how do you address that um so we had well first of all we are all all of the people that work for ramadog have some ties to the godot community already that's how we found them so they are used to the pace of development on the one end and on the other hand it is a matter for us of creating a product that we can support on the on the platforms that we say we will support, right? So that is why the uh, Godot 4 version of the studio is still a little ways out because we want to have the ES2 renderer in there. We want to have some of these uh, li- uh, uh, life improvements uh, in there. And the reason for starting with Godot 3 really was pragmatic in the sense that um, there are a lot of Godot 3 mobile games out already. So we want to make it easy for people who already have their games to say, okay, I'm going to take the game I already have, uh, add the Rematech ads to it, and actually try to make some money off of the games that that I've already made. Right? And Godot 4 is uh, new enough still that the, the number of games for which that is true is relatively low. And because we plan to be uh, entirely compatible with the upstream version, by the time we have a version of the Ramatalk Mobile Studio based on Godot 4. The games will also be ready around that time. And because we want to, like I said, we want to be cross-compatible, it is not really a downside for us to not have it yet because the open source version exists and people can make their games already, right? So that is one of the um, critical things for us is that we we don't need to be first to market for you know, platforms because good already exists. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I wanted to wrap up by asking uh, whether there are any creators in the Godot space, you know, whether mobile specific or not, uh, in particular that you you would recommend to folks who are curious about Godot or looking to improve their skills as they go. Sure. So first of all, uh, GD Quest makes fantastic. Um, uh, learning content, and I cannot recommend his stuff enough. His uh, his tutorials are fantastic. Uh, it's super high quality, well polished. Definitely worth your time. Uh, I have no like financial ties to him, but I can <laughs> I can I can only recommend that uh, try some of his free content. And if you're interested, his uh, his paid for content is fantastic. Uh, second of all, there is a developer that is making a game called Road to Vostok, which I believe is a um, uh, a sort of a survival looter shooter. I think I'm not sure if the looter part is correct, but uh, that's kind correct. of the vibe yeah. I got. Yeah. yeah. And um, his uh, Patreon, his free pages on Patreon have a fantastic porting log of when he decided to move away from Unity to Godot. And he has a very honest um, uh, description of things that he really liked, things that we didn't like so much. And the other nice thing is, is that he has screenshots of his game actually in progress. So for people who are um, skeptical that like a, a let's say, double A looking game can be made in Godot today, um, his, his blogs and his screenshots and videos really, I think, prove that you can. Uh, another interesting project is... Uh, disclaimer there that my I, they are a customer of mine, which uh, prehends out there, so, so take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. But a project called The Mirror is making a very interesting um, piece of software where they're basically doing a sort of Roblox-y like thing uh, using Godot uh, that looks really good and uh, the people who are making it are really nice and uh, I think that is going to be a very interesting platform for people to get into game dev at all um, compared to say uh, actually starting to right. write code right away. Uh, so those will be my three main recommendations I think. Perfect yeah those all sound great. I mean the, the Vostok one especially is it's it's a very rare occasion to see someone porting their game across platform live, let alone you know sharing all of it and sharing their opinions and co- fully committing to to going through with it. So I think that's a really useful recommendation for a bunch of reasons. Yeah, and 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 that developer is a machine man. He managed to port some of this stuff in times where I was like, how is this even possible? Yeah, and and to get to to get back a little bit to something we talked about earlier, he's doing it all in GD script. So. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> valid language valid language um exactly perfect. well thank you so much it's been um super interesting i definitely uh have learned an awful lot about uh developing games for mobile um from your your content and from our chat today so yeah thank you so much for joining us you're welcome and thank you so much for having me